Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Barbara Ryan, and I'm Executive Director of the World Geospatial Industry Council, and I'm just delighted to be here today. Uh, thank you for your participation. I'd also like to thank uh, our hosts, ITU, Andrea, Manara, uh, Reinhard, Skoll, and their entire team. Uh, it's been just a pleasure working with you, Andrea. Uh, thank you very much. There are three, uh, their, their entire series of uh, webinars, as you just saw from the video, is AI for Good. We've um, dissected that a little bit to drill down to geospatial AI. And so there are three cohorts, uh, myself from WGIC, Nadine Alama from OGC, and Maria Bervelli uh, from the Polytechnic uh, de, de Milano in Italy, and also um, chair of the United Nations Global Geographic Information Management System, the UNGGIM Academic Network. So I wanna uh, do also a shout out to Maria and um, uh, Nadine for their help on this. Um, listen, we've got a great lineup today, and um, I don't want to take too much time, but we're really here uh, for this session to talk about uh, GOAI and ethics. So whether it's ensuring industry policies uh, and positions are aligned with the growing concerns, um, ethical concerns that exist, how better to integrate uh, ethics into this work, how can data governance help AI uh, modes and traceability, for example, and traceability, you know, what are the aspects of personal privacy and how they impact uh, the entire debate and the entire uh, discussion. Um, and, uh, and we've got four just outstanding speakers that are going to touch on those topics as well as some others. And, um, you know, I was just going to give a minute or two on each person um, but I'll tell you, as they sent me their biographies, I really would like to indulge you for just reading a little bit more because you're going to find um, that there's a lot of information in these bi biographies. And I think it may give you and the audience um, some reason to contact any of these other speakers following the event. So first up, I'll, I'll go through all the introductions. Uh, then each of the speakers is going to talk about seven minutes. Uh, we'll then, when all four speakers are done, we'll then turn it over to a discussion period and questions and answers. And so I hope if you have questions in the audience, you'll post them and then they'll get uh, fed to uh, us backstage. So thank you for doing that. Um, first of all, I would like the first speaker is going to be Caroline Gavart. Uh, Caroline and Caroline, you might want to turn on your video so people can see you. She's an assistant professor at the Faculty Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, that's ITC at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on the use of satellite and drone imagery and machine learning to support development projects in lower middle income countries. PhD dissertation on mapping informal settlements with drones or was awarded a cum laude distinction and won a Tianstra research prize. More recently, she's been awarded a prestigious personal research grant from the Dutch Research Council to investigate how to make AI in geospatial uh, uh, workflows fair and explainable. She's co-chair of the International Society of Digital Earth, that's ISDE, Working Group 3, 
on digital earth governance and ethics. And starting in 2022, she's a member of the Young Academy of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, also works as an international consultant for the World Bank as a remote sensing and machine learning uh, specialist. Uh, Caroline, we're just delighted to have you here today. The next speaker in the lineup is going to be Stephen Galsworthy. Stephen, maybe you can turn on your video. He's a data leader skilled at building high performance digital teams and passionate about developing data powder powered products with lasting impact for users, business and society. He's a uh, head of uh, data at TomTom, a leading provider of mapping and location technology, and he's helping to drive the company's data transformation. I might add that TomTom Tom is a WGIC member, so thanks, Stephen, for that. Uh, previously, he was chief data officer at Quibi, an Amsterdam-based tech company offering data-driven energy services, oversaw its transformation from a hardware-based business to a digital organization with data and AI at its core, has a master's degree and PhD in mathematics from Oxford and has been leading data sciences teams since 2011, uh, lives in ultra Netherlands with his wife and two children, holds both uh, British and Dutch citizenship. So Stephen, thanks for that. Uh, next, our third speaker is going to be Amina al Sharif. I mean, if you could turn on your videos, the Chief Innovation Officer and Head of Special Projects at Anno.ai, spent over 10 years in the Department of Defense serving as an Army officer in the Reserves and North Carolina National Guard, remains focused on bringing culture, process, and technical innovation to DOD and the intelligence community at large. Uh, prior to Anno, Amina uh, worked as a customer engineer on the Google Cloud platform, bringing the innovation and power of Google's capabilities to the development of defense and intelligence community. She works with the government to help improve mission effectiveness through adoption of commercial cloud services with a focus on big data and machine learning, gaming and simulation, data privacy and security in those environments, cloud, cloud computing and analytics. Mina holds a BA in linguistics and Arabic from the University of Mississippi and a master's in professional studies in cybersecurity and information sciences from Penn State, go Nittany Lions. She regularly blogs on Medium, uh, documenting her self-taught technical career. In January, 2020, she published her first book, An Approach to Machine Learning in Cyber Defense for the Department of Defense. I mean, it's great to have you here. Last but not least will be our fourth speaker, Chris Tucker. Chris, we'll turn on your video. Uh, Chris uh, thinks and works at the intersection of technology, strategy, geography, and national security. He manages Yale House Ventures, a portfolio of technology companies, social ventures, and public entrepreneurship initiatives. He's chairman of the American Geographical Society, where he launched Geography 2050, a multi-year strategic dialogue about the vital trends shaping the geography of our planet. At AGS, he also helped launch its Ethical Geo Initiative. Uh, you'll hear more about that in the Locus Charter as an international charter for the responsible use of uh, location technologies. And not to be outdone uh, by uh, uh, Amina, uh, I don't have a copy of her book, but I do have a copy of Chris's book, uh, A Planet of Three Billion. Sorry, my video background is um, disturbing the view of the book. Um, but uh, Chris, you didn't list that in your biography, so I figured I better give you a plug for the book. Um, thank you, everybody. You guys, the, I'm just so impressed with uh, those biographies. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, uh, Caroline, we'll turn it, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much, Barbara, uh, for the introduction. Um, if everything is well, then you should be able to see my slides now and hear me correctly. Um, so my background is as a geospatial scientist. I also work with a lot of projects trying to impl um, implement geospatial uh, 
um, solutions to support disaster risk management and other development objectives. And what I would like to start talking about and open this session with is about the implementation challenges that we are facing. So there's a lot of attention about AI ethics and in the field of geospatial, it is no different. Um, so I will give some examples of how it is difficult to change what but as we move from guidelines to implementation, some of the challenges that we are facing. So I will give um, a tech, uh, use bias as an example of technical implementation difficulties. And also I would like to talk a bit about the uh, importance of local context and inclusivity. So as a first example, um, the UNESCO recommendation on ethics for artificial intelligence says that AI actors should minimize all reasonable efforts um, or they should make all reasonable efforts to minimize and avoid reinforcing or perpetuating discriminatory, uh, discriminatory or biased applications. So there's a lot of attention in the media um, about possible bias for gender, ethnicity or age um, in different AI applications. But what about geospatial applications? Let me give you an example. Here we see um, aerial imagery of a, a city in Africa. And on the left and right, we see building outlines that were digitized by community. So with some community members, they looked at the images and they delimited where the buildings were. And on the right, you see the results of the AI algorithm that automatically predicted where the buildings are. And so the, uh, this is really important for a context of disaster risk management, because, for example, sometimes a disaster occurs in a city for which the base data is not, not yet available. So then we need to have data, for, for example, buildings to estimate where people are. And um, essentially, it's just a, a polygon. That's the only information we have. We don't have any attribute information about what's actually under the building. But as we can see here, one of the big differences between the AI algorithm and the community-based building outlines is that the AI algorithm is actually missing a lot of buildings in the central part of the image. And these buildings are smaller and closer together and are very typical for informal areas or slums. So what this essentially means is if you compare the two different data sources, that the AI algorithm might actually be biased against the areas that are more informal and uh, perhaps more, uh, poorer than the other areas of the city. And so this has huge implications if you are using this for disaster risk management. And these types of biases that we might find in geospatial data sets are very important, but also very difficult to identify because here you need to actually look at the image and understand the local context in order to realize that you might be biased against, uh, for example, in this case, informal settlements. And so you really need to take care because it is not the application where the data itself will have an attribute that says formal or informal that you can use to check whether the algorithm is biased or not. So um, we need to have a better understanding of local context. And also we need to develop uh, technical mechanisms in order to be able to audit geospatial data sets in particular. So geospatial vector data, also imagery um, to see whether it is biased or not. Um, a second aspect that is often mentioned by uh, AI ethics guidelines is fairness or inclusivity. So for example, again, the UN recommendations say um, that it is important to promote inclusive access for all, including local communities to AI systems with locally relevant content and services and with respect for cultural diversity. And so also this cultural diversity is quite a tricky issue because even though we might at the global level agree to certain guidelines or values, especially implementation at a local level um, may cause some differences. I mean, also with different cultures, we tend to prioritize different values or principles. And as we are implementing guidelines, you may need to balance one against the other. So for example, um, a colleague of mine, also co-chair of the, the same working group, did a very good work where she was saying, okay, if you look at um, AI ethics guidelines that are typically developed in um, Europe or in North America, they tend to uh, give an important role to the principle of autonomy. So they say, okay, individuals have the right to make decisions for themselves. And yet, if you look at many cultures across Africa, uh, they may promote more a community value. And so this tension between community and individual will also cause differences when you try to um, implement guidelines at a local level. 
um, in some of the work also that we did during my PhD, we were looking at um, the issue of privacy or the concept of privacy in different areas. So a very typical um, example of geospatial data is aerial imagery. And then if you look at drone imagery, you can see very detailed information in the image. And then if you are talking about protecting the privacy of the people living in a certain area before we share an image, it's also important to understand, okay, well, according to that culture, what is considered to be private or not? And then we found that in a, a settlement in Kigali in Rwanda, that for example, the objects that you could see in the image were very different compared to the objects that were considered to be sensitive um, in Tanzania, that the people living in these areas consider different objects to be sensitive. And so this will obviously have very different implications for what you need to be careful of if you are talking about privacy. Um, and then some examples of good practices. Barbara mentioned in the introduction that I'm also involved as a consultant in the World Bank. And there we're also having a number of discussions about how to um, consider like AI ethics and inclusivity in some of the projects that are being done. Um, and this led to a number of examples. Um, for example, the Open Cities AI Challenge, which was really directed at creating more inclusive benchmark data. So there we um, had a number of community-based projects uh, where we worked with community members to digitize building outlines. And this was um, put together into a benchmark data set to also help develop more inclusive um, building identification algorithms by making this data freely available. Uh, we also did some work on how you can include local community members in the validation of global data sets. So for example, for digital works uh, for urban resilience, where we can look at how can we provide more local information um, compared to the global data sets that are often developed in offices in certain places, how can they actually be validated on the ground by including also local knowledge and also developing the digital skills of the people doing the validation and also considering uh, low cost technologies and skill development. So for example, the Zanspar mapping initiative looked at uh, utilizing drone imagery, but also making it more inclusive by looking at different ways that it could be used locally and also making sure that there's a very solid level of digital skills on the ground in order to make sure that some of the benefits are being shared in different places. So um, to conclude, a number of the challenges that I would like to emphasize that we are facing is not only looking at the AI ethics guidelines for which a lot of work is being done now, but what can we do to implement them and what are some of the challenges that we are facing in the geospatial community? So first of all, for geospatial data, we will need different technical implementation um, in order to audit algorithms and uh, develop explainability issues. And also um, we will need to look at local context and inclusivity. So if you look through the WGIC report on policy trends, uh, policy and trends for geo AI, uh, they mentioned that they, I like how they emphasize that companies shouldn't wait, but to start developing best practices that can be used as examples for standards. But also in this context, we should pay attention that where a lot of the global geospatial companies are based and also where the applications are sometimes uh, in different areas. So also in this context, it's very important to um, take into consideration the local context and inclusivity. So um, those are my points to uh, start this discussion and I very much look forward to discussing them more with you later on. Thank you. Caroline, thank you so much. That was a, a really nice job of setting the context for the rest of the talk. And I appreciate you bringing uh, your last slide on some challenges. Um, Stephen, um, you're next. So we'll go ahead, Stephen Galsworthy, TomTom, Tom, head of data. Thanks, Stephen. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Stephen Galsworthy. Um, I'm head of data at uh, TomTom. Um, so, so Tom, Tom, uh, we see ourselves as the leading independent location technology specialist. So what, what does that mean we provide? We typically split our services into three different areas. So we are providing uh, highly accurate maps um, that we uh, create our, typically create ourselves, both from what we call SD maps, which are standard definition, which is the kind of maps that you would that a human can read all the way into uh, HD maps, which is essentially a machine readable map that can be used for things such as autonomous driving. We create a navigation software. Uh, this is uh, typically 
uh, available as a, a consumer product embedded within a, 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 an automobile or, or a truck. Or um, we provide our, our services to, to what we call enterprise customers, so, so large uh, mobility providers worldwide. And a third big area for us is a real-time uh, traffic uh, and services. So TopTop is a, a tech company, uh, and really at the heart of it is, is data. Uh, data drives what we're doing with the business. To give you a little bit of a, a flavor there, I mean, we're collecting from the services we offer around about 61 billion GPS data points per day globally. That equates to around about three and a half billion kilometers uh, of roads that are traveled on a, on a daily basis. But in this space, uh, really for us, data privacy comes first and data privacy is, is not, it's not optional for us. Data privacy is even a strategic differentiator for, for TomTom Tom within the, the mapping and navigation space. Um, and we see that, that that's really something that's the, at the heart of everything that we're, we're doing. So what I wanted to do today is to give a little bit of a flavor of, of diving into uh, diving into a use case and seeing how that relates to, to ethics and what I, what I typically call the responsible AI. So how can you deploy AI in a way that is that meets all those, those ethical and privacy requirements? So, so the, the use case um, that we can dive into a little bit more detail is looking into uh, traffic flow. So uh, across TomTom, Tom, there's many areas where we either uh, deploy AI services or have the potential of deploying uh, AI services. Uh, traffic flow is a very interesting proposition. So traffic is essentially you can you can imagine when you're driving to a, a location, what you want to, to do is to have a, an accurate idea of uh, how long it's going to take you to get there, what time you will uh, arrive at your, your end destination. For, for an individual driver, this is um, uh, incredibly important if you need to be at a location at a certain time. But imagine if you, you scale this up to the, the scale of a uh, of a large logistics company that is dealing with thousands of vehicles that they need to, to manage on a on a minute by minute basis. So the problem itself is, is a really a fundamentally important one in, in, in the business. The way it works right now is that we get a lot of information that's being uploaded to, to TomTom servers from devices that are, are connected. So these can be navigation devices down to mobile phones embedded within um, uh, automobiles. Uh, and that's over 600 million uh, devices that are providing a data source here. Um, depending on country, we see up to one in five vehicles on the road can be contributing to TomTom's real-time traffic um, updates. But what does this mean is the problem if you respond, phrase it in terms of responsibility of AI. So if I break it down, what I see is sort of this, the six main pillars of responsible AI. So you're, you're thinking in terms of some of the ideas that were raised earlier around fairness, inclusiveness, uh, transparency, and explainability of models. I've had also pillars around privacy and security, reliability and safety, and accountability. Um, from an industry perspective, it, it very much depends on the use case that you're, you're, you're tackling, which of these is, is incredibly important. So, I mean, if you take the example of uh, traffic and predicting uh, travel times, like privacy and security of the data is, is really high. Reliability and, and, and safety of any recommendations that are given for, for navigation, particularly relating to autonomous driving, is super top of mind and accountability um, is super important for a, for a tech company. We need to be accountable for what we're providing. But if, if you take this uh, example, the, the inclusiveness of the service, I mean, not to say that it's unimportant, but it, it becomes less relevant for this particular use case. Um, uh, fairness and transparency, I mean, again, what we're trying to, to do in this case, you want to provide the most accurate estimate of, a, of travel time uh, when you're going to arrive at a destination. So the incentives for uh, TomTom as the tech provider are very much aligned with 
trying to provide the best uh, service possible. So then when you get into the issues of transparency and perhaps explainability of the AI uh, model, that really, um, the, the amount of effort that you want to put on that really depends with the, the use case. I mean, it's it's quite different using uh, AI to um, to estimate the time that you're going to arrive at the destination. If in if in the worst case that the the estimate is is wrong, you know that's that's going to be a uh, that's going to be a cost to the the end user. It's very different than if you compare it to some examples of where AI is used, perhaps in uh, determining prison sentences for for prisoners that have um, have been seen to commit uh, certain crimes. So the the balances of these these pillars of responsible AI, it's it's very important to to weigh up um, the relative importance uh, at all times. So the, I was asked to give a little bit of advice. What what does this mean for uh, developers who are actually building services uh, like this? So when you're uh, trying to solve a, a problem, trying to solve a use case, you should really be looking at the challenge you're solving, make sure that you're, you're, you're assessing it in relation to these pillars of responsible AI, but making sure that the trade-offs that you make are the right ones to ensure that you reach the, the right quality of service for, the, uh, for, for, your, for your end users. But you've also got to keep top of mind, like particularly privacy of some of this data, you know, that's, that's, that's super important to do. Um, and that's where we have a lot of uh, custom processes um, at TomTom to make sure that we're depersonalizing that data at the earliest possible opportunity. So I, I hope today you enjoyed hearing a little bit about um, how ethics and AI are seen a little bit from the, the industrial point of view. Um, looking forward to discussing further with you later. Stephen, thank you. Um, very much. I like that uh, last graph with each of those components. And so we may come back to that a little bit later. Um, all right, next, Amina Al-Sharif, you've got the floor. Thank you. I'll go ahead and wait for the slides to pull up. Awesome. Okay. So um, like we said in the introductions, my name is Amina Al-Sharif. Uh, I not only uh, lead innovation at Anno AI, but I also am the chief data ethics officer there. Um, and I also lead a 501c6 organization called the Data Ethics Consortium for Security. Um, and this consortium is focused entirely on bringing issues of data ethics. Uh, and I'll talk about why we call it data ethics as opposed to AI ethics. Data, data ethics to the surface for startups working in the national security, corporate um, security and law enforcement space. Um, so DEX is, is focused on bringing startups together. Uh, we do hands-on research. We give out hands-on uh, hands deliverables that the startups can actually execute within the organization uh, and are currently engaging with policymakers on the Hill for education purposes primarily to make sure that they are tracking and seeing some of the data ethics uh, related issues that we see as startups in the national security, law enforcement and corporate security space. Um, so that's that. Uh, one other interesting part of my story is I was one of the principal engineers on Project Maven at Google. Um, so I had transitioned to Google in 2017 after a deployment to Afghanistan with the task force there. Uh, and then transitioned straight into a career at Google as a machine learning cloud engineer, uh, was working on Project Maven for a period of time. And for those who are familiar, uh, that's one of the most well-known uh, and probably most prominent and most significant uh, data and AI ethics related project that came to light uh, via the news um, in 2017, in 2018 timeframe. Um, so that was also a very interesting experience for me to see hands on uh, right in front of me on the, the materials that I was working on, how it was affecting, how ethics was affecting um, companies ability to work on national security issues as it related to overhead imagery and as it related to overhead platforms, uh, unmanned platforms. Uh, so that was a really, really interesting time in my life that ultimately led me to to open this 501c6 um, to, to dedicate towards uh, talking about data ethics issues and bringing people together in probably a better way uh, than what happened publicly 
uh, between Google and the Department of Defense at the time. Um, so when it comes to talking about ethics uh, and, and geospatial issues, uh, at ANA, we deal with geospatial issues all the time. Uh, we provide an annotation platform for overhead imagery, uh, TUAV and WAMI for um, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, the Jake up in Northern Virginia. And we've started to see uh, in our own hands-on work in developing models to do auto detections that there are definitely um, some very significant issues around overhead imagery and a geo bias. And the reason why we see this, or, or let, me, let me explain kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, what you're seeing in front of you is a mapping of commonly used satellite imagery data sets for machine learning training. So these are data sets that are commonly used by data scientists to do uh, machine learning training. It's very obvious where the gaps are right, in terms of collect and in terms of where, where we're seeing imagery coming from. And those gaps are extremely important because what they do is they don't provide any geospatial context, either from an overhead perspective or on the ground perspective. But in here, this case, we're focusing on overhead. Uh, it really does provide a, a perspective on just where the gaps are uh, and where we're, we're possibly missing more, um, data around some of those those areas of the world. So those areas of the world uh, continue to have no machine learning models that have been trained um, to accommodate for those areas of the world. One of those areas of the world is where I come from, Egypt. <laughs> so uh, the Northern African region and the Sahara region, a uh, very prominent uh, desert region, um, not not very much data coming from that area of the world. So this this map represents a big gap in collection geographically. Um, think of all the open source data sets that we know of uh, that are not geo explicit. Uh, some of these include ImageNet and Coco, both of which are used by our companies and many other startups in the national security space to tackle the issue of overhead imagery. Um, so the question that I pose to the crowd and I pose to, to the group is, how do we be more explicit about geographic diversity? And of course, this conversation kind of moves further out uh, to, to kind of have implications on the composition of a machine learning uh, team, whether that's at our company at Anno or at your company or at the Department of Defense or any uh, other kind of uh, large organization that is performing data science functions. Does this geographic diversity present a conduit to demographic diversity. Uh, and this is not only demographic diversity in machine learning training data sets, but this also has uh, you know, larger implications and has a larger comment on the larger issue of having geographically and de demographically diverse uh, machine learning teams in order to ensure model development processes are of good quality. One small example before I move to the next slide is, um, I am, <laughs> this is, uh, I come from Egypt and was raised in the Western desert. Uh, very versed in the area of desert overhead imagery. Um, I, I know the desert inside and out. But if you were to put uh, overhead imagery in front of me uh, that represented a forest region or a region with a ton of trees or vegetation, um, I might not be as strong in my labeling and model development skills there. But because I have worked the Middle East problem set for now 11 going on 12 years, uh, I have a lot of exposure to what uh, satellite imagery looks like in an arid environment. Uh, next slide. So this slide is very complicated and <laughs> convoluted, uh, but there's only one part of the slide that I'd like you to focus on. And it's not really very well represented uh, in the actual uh, diagram itself in terms of how we do it, but I'll explain how we do it. So Anno AI, uh, with myself as the inventor, uh, did file a provisional patent uh, just a couple weeks ago on what we're calling a compliance as code system diagram. This is not the typical compliance as code uh, that, that everyone might be thinking of, where it's like a data governance, but automated. Uh, the idea here is actually within our, our products at Anno um, is to make sure that based on where data is being collected geographically, that all of the proper uh, rules and regulations and restrictions around accessing that data is at, are implemented automatically for both our internal team and for our customers. So let me give you an example. Uh, the general flow on this on this slide here is we start with the raw data at the sensor or point of collection. 
uh, we encrypt that data uh, for rest and on the move, and then it enters our system, which is our product. Um, the data science team might need to access the raw data that is completely unfiltered in order for them to do model building for our customers. That is kind of the part of what we do is, is services as we build models for our customers. But then we have what we call an anonymization pipeline. And this pipeline is meant to keep both our teams internally and our customers in compliance, especially when it comes to PII. So the way we infer, first and foremost, uh, the way we infer what restrictions and what obfuscations to put on the data is firstly an object detection, uh, object detector, which is a suite of models that detects things like spaces, license plates, cars, uh, homes, home addresses, mailboxes, things of that nature that might actually be considered sensitive or PII or identifiable to a, a particular person. And then we go straight to the region detector, detection. Uh, and what the region detection does is, for example, uh, we have law enforcement customers, plenty of them, uh, that we uh, service and cater to. And one of the uh, law enforcement customers that we cater to is in the Minnesota Police Department. Now, Minnesota, ever since the Black Lives Matter movement happened, has now had extremely restrictive um, uh, access for law enforcement entities to license plates. Uh, specifically license plates and faces, but license plates in particular. So in the case of the Minnesota Police Department, if they were a customer of ours, some of the restrictions that we would have to enforce in our product in order to make them in, and keep them in compliance is things like they can only query against a blacklist. They're not actually allowed to see all the raw license plate data um, in, in, in an aggregate, in a raw kind of data store format. Um, and when they query those uh, license plates, those license plates have to be Minnesota license plates. So this is where the kind of geo aspect comes in of not only does our license plate detector in this system need to be able to detect license plates, but it also needs to determine which state that license plate belongs to in order to enforce those individual states' uh, rules around accessing PII of which license plates are considered PII uh, in almost all states that we work in. Um, so this is just an example of a system that we are building out currently uh, that is very much geo uh, driven in order to ensure that data that is in different areas of the world is ethically accessed, right? But not just ethically accessed, but also ethically developed upon. So this region detector is gonna give a ton of context to our data science and engineering teams when it comes to actually building machine learning models and implementing them into a system. And then it also has huge implications on our customers in terms of we are helping keeping them in compliance by essentially taking all of the regional, every potential regional legal uh, stipulation around accessing data uh, whether it's PII or other types of data, and enforcing that automatically in the tools uh, that we build and the products that we build. Uh, so that's all I've got for today. Uh, back over to you for uh, our next speaker. I mean, thanks. Um, I appreciate that. And the flowchart uh, was particularly helpful. And Actually, sound effects in the background sounds like you've got uh, some. Uh, uh, so you've got some company. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. The babysitters <laughs> are late this morning, and I'm I'm multitasking like crazy. Single mom life. I'm so sorry. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be a future employee in uh, the geospatial technologies. <laughs> All right. No thanks. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, Chris, um, we'll turn it over to you. Wonderful, thanks. And uh, uh, given my computing situation, you'll see my face briefly and then uh, uh, move on to my slides. Barb, thanks so much for uh, having me as part of uh, this, this panel. And uh, Carolyn, uh, uh, Stephen, and Nina, I mean, what a great um, set of presentations. I think this really points out to me 
there is such fertile ground in this space for brilliant people to do amazing work. The, the flip side to it is there's so much work to be done and such a diversity of work that needs to be done. It's, it's just really, really daunting. And I think that's really what inspired some of the work I'll be presenting today uh, on uh, the Locust Charter. So if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, share my screen and flip over to uh, my, my presentation. <sighs> And uh, hopefully you can see it. And if not, uh, somebody let me know. So uh, Locust Charter. Um, my name is Chris Tucker. I'm chairman of the American Geographical Society. And we've been uh, really proud to uh, be part of a global team that has brought the Locust Charter to life. Uh, the American Geographical Society, we have our own uh, initiative we call Ethical Geo Initiative, started a number of years ago. And it's not the first uh, initiative in the geospatial ge geography space uh, to focus on ethics. It's actually uh, a, an area of longstanding concern, <clears throat> but also one that has really not been coalesced uh, in a way that brings together government, industry, academe, and the social sector uh, to talk about it more broadly. Um, we had the uh, honor to receive some funding from Omidyar Network. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with Pierre Omidyar's uh, uh, philanthropy, um, they have had a long history in actually funding uh, uh, ethical AI initiatives. And they were focused really on, they had been doing work around, I'd call it geo for good in the property rights space. And they were wondering, you know, why hasn't there been focus on uh, ethical geo in the same way as ethical AI? So we had an opportunity to launch that initiative with them at the same time that they funded the benchmark initiative in England and in, in the UK uh, uh, through Geovation uh, in London. Um, and then we had some subsequent funding from the Henry Luce Foundation during COVID to really look at the ethical implications of the use of location tech uh, uh, as, as part of the biosurveillance apparatuses that were either deployed or being considered uh, to be deployed during um, during a kind of peak COVID. So, you know, when we were, when we got started as AGS on Ethical Geo, we were focused on all sorts of things. A lot of times people talk about privacy <clears throat> um, and that's certainly very important. People talk about kind of the bias in the GOAI space and that's very important. Um, but these things also kind of uh, apply to what we call the five Ps, uh, not only privacy, but <clears throat> It, it, it inserting kind of distorted incentives into political processes um, uh, as it deals with people kind of undermining uh, or bias uh, against vulnerable populations uh, in, in, in our societies, um, skewing how we understand our planet and our ability to support our planet. And then back to property, um, actually, I think uh, in Caroline's example of informal settlements, there's so much bias built into how geospatial, even without AI, how uh, geospatial has empowered some of the uh, wealthier and more organized uh, to the disadvantage of uh, uh, vulnerable populations. Um, and in the geo for good movement, if you will, um, luckily we've had a lot of empowerment through geo that has uh, allowed um, vulnerable populations to try to uh, encode their property. So you can understand kind of this complex landscape here uh, that caused us to look at, uh, look at ourselves and realize there was no international charter for the responsible use of geospatial tech, whether you're just talking about regular GIS or remote sensing or these more advanced geo AI uh, uh, capabilities that are seem to be rolling out every single day across the private sector, the public sector and in uh, academic and nonprofit worlds. So we dreamed of a world where location data is utilized for the betterment of the world uh, uh, and all species that live in it. And we wanted to build an international collaboration of governments organizations and individual practitioners seeking to ensure the ethical and responsible use of location data throughout the world. And to do that, we needed to kind of coalesce our thinking, coalesce uh, our understanding of the space into some uh, guidelines, some principles. So we started uh, a small team, again, kind of the ethical geo and the benchmark initiative team by reaching out to our the global community through organizations like this, through the Open Geospatial Consortium, through so many different uh, part of part of the traditional 
uh, international geospatial fabric, if you will. And we convened a number of facilitated groups across Latin America, Africa, East Asia, uh, Australia, uh, Pacific, UK, Europe, and in North America, recognizing that there's many different values at play. There's many different ki uh, kind of cultural contexts that need to be appreciated. Uh, uh, the legal frameworks are at different points of evolution in different countries and different regions around the world. And even uh, the point in development, economic development around the world means there's different kinds of technologies in play and, and how uh, uh, communities weigh kind of the costs and benefits of new technologies uh, will differ depending on where where they're coming from. So, you know, what we kind of were grappling with was this datification uh, process that's going on around the world, where increasingly, you know, we're not just living in a physical world where we interface uh, face to face, but we've datified our planet, uh, where we're expressing and managing this complex world that we live in with data. And, you know, since that's a made up word, I decided to make up another one where I call it the locationization. And it's not what we found was there's actually kind of a gap between the traditional data community um, uh, and how they think about it. And then how we think about it when that data at its heart is about X, Y, Z's and T's. Um, so, you know, as increasingly, uh, uh, you know, we have GPS embedded in every device that's doing sensed observations of our world. And, you know, we've kind of commodified how we uh, 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 understand the world geospatially. This locationization, if you will, is bringing those X, Y, Zs and Ts to the middle of kind of our standard data ethics discussions around bias, intrusions on privacy, market power relations, data colonialism. Um, you know, there's there's so much complexity uh, to this that we realized we needed to uh, build a, a charter. So I'm not going to go into each of these. Uh, I really just do this to tease you uh, to come to the website. If you just Google Locust Charter, it will come up and, and you can uh, browse these to your heart's content. But these are very deliberate. Um, uh, we actually weren't committed to having 10. It's just kind of, you know, magical symmetry in, in, uh, in the work that we were doing here came up with 10. Um, and we have uh, brought together a community already of a dozen organizations that are signatories uh, to this. They are supporters of the charter um, with the notion that this is a good start. And there's a lot of room uh, to grow and to continue to evolve these principles, uh, to adapt them to uh, different parts of the world, and to adapt them as technology and policy and law and values evolve over time. But we do believe that there's some sort of enduring uh, nature to these founding principles as we put together. It ranges everything from realizing opportunities of geo for good, right? That's the most ethical thing we can do is uh, use these technologies to do as much good as possible, but doing it in a way that understands our impacts, that uh, is committed to doing no harm, that is committed to protecting the vulnerable, addressing bias, minimizing intrusion into our lives, uh, minimizing data about the X, Y, Zs and Ts of our lives and how that data leaks out into the world, uh, protecting our privacy, preventing identification of individuals, which is something that uh, 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 geospatial data, particularly uh, telemetry data, is particularly good at. You know, 95% uh, of uh, where, we, uh, where we are at midnight, right, is, is probably our homes. Um, and these things are easily reversible uh, via public, uh, publicly available data to, to really un, un, uh, unpeel you know, the, the multiple layers of our lives and to provide accountability. So if you read these, uh, while they, they may at the high level sound like a lot of other uh, uh, charters that are out there for data ethics, I think you'll understand, uh, as you read the detail, you'll see why these are particularly geo in nature. So we have had a lot of signatories already, and we encourage all of you to uh, get involved. Um, location ethics in, in practice, right, it's not just, hey, we have a charter, um, but it is something that you use in your everyday, uh, uh, much like Amina was uh, laying out, right, uh, in the work they're doing around data in uh, uh, data ethics around small businesses focused on national security and policing, et cetera. Um, it's something that you have to use every day. And what we found is 
all these businesses that we talk to, all these governments seek to be ethical in their use of geospatial data, but they don't have something to lean on, or at least they didn't have something to lean on. Um, so as a good starting place, as something to lean on, we provided the Locust Charter and we encourage everyone to use it in your uh, everyday uh, functioning of your businesses. So you can all become part of the community. Um, and we encourage you to not only read the charter, but if you're interested in becoming a, uh, a, a, a uh, supporter, um, you, we have a letter you can sign and join in and uh, we'll be having um, increasing governance discussions over the next um, year uh, as we build this community and get more people involved. So thanks so much. Great. Um, Chris, thanks so much for that. Um, listen, if everyone can turn on your cameras, Caroline, uh, Stephen, we may have lost Amina for uh, a little bit. We'll wait <clears throat> for her to come back. Um, listen, I've been checking um, the chat box and Q&A, and I, do, I think uh, there was a question from uh, Alexei uh, Sorali, uh, but uh, Caroline, you did answer that? Yes, I did. Okay. All right. Great. Um, listen, um, we've got just a couple minutes and I'm not seeing any questions come in. Of course, if you're out there in the audience, please write them, uh, please write them in. Um, you guys, do you, if we um, just took a minute and if you, um, from where you sit, what do you think of what's what's the greatest challenge that you're going to be facing right now? I guess, or the greatest opportunity to make some improvement. Um, Caroline, you talked a little bit about the end of, in terms of challenges. Of course, you can jump in on that. And then um, Stephen and Chris, if you guys also and Amina's back, um, just greatest greatest challenge and or greatest opportunity. I guess it's you know how how you kind of look at these problems. For, for what's kind of facing this entire field. Caroline, you wanna start just cause your, your slide started to go into that? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's really just how do we do it? I think we are agreeing on, on the principles that we want to do. Everybody here wants to do a better job. You know, the industry is interested, academia, policymakers. Um, nobody wants to be unintentionally biased or uninclusive, but the question is, how do we do it? So indeed, the programmers sitting there, how can they know, um, like, like Stephen mentioned, okay, you know, you need to think of what the end users want, but that's also not always easy. Or how can you check? What about explainability? How can you explain the algorithms? And, and this is partly um, talking with different people and being more inclusive, um, that the technician is... Uh, should also be talking with the end users, but it's also simply of identifying ways of doing it. It's like, okay, how can we really audit the algorithms? How can external parties audit the algorithms? So it, it's really just a way of finding good practices of actually getting things done. I think at, I think at this stage, that's the greatest challenge. Okay. All right, thanks, Caroline. Uh, comments from other folks, either on what Caroline just said or uh, your ideas on greatest challenges. Anybody can jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. One of the things we're trying to do around Locust Charter with our supporters is to kind of collect those um, snippets, those use cases of where, you know, inside my organization, uh, because of the nature of the work we do, we're very focused on principle number seven. And here's how we have worked at an engineering level. Here's how we've worked at a policy level in order to bring our customers along or make sure that our technology you know, um, offering uh, applies to that. And we kind of feel like that there's so much richness to this, to these, you know, uh, to the, the struggles that we have, but also the principles that we're trying to adhere to, that we want to build that library of experience um, because, you know, sometimes our organizations, they're so fast moving and so complex that we know we have an issue, but we can't put our finger on it. And it's when we read other people's experiences that we go, ah, you know, now, now I can think about how to deal with this inside my organization because I have some, you know, analogies to operate from. So that's something we're hoping to do. And, you know, it could be as simple as a paragraph from Anna AI and, you know, a paragraph from TomTom Tom and a paragraph from Esri UK saying, you know, here's a thing we grappled with, here's what we did. And maybe that's something everybody can learn from. But I, to me, the biggest challenge is really 
There's a lot of well-meaning IT folks that understand the power or they're seeing the power of geo, but they're not geo folks. And so I feel like there's a lot of um, cultural blind spots, if you will. And when they just start doing geo with all the best intentions, but they don't understand kind of the, the, the underlying complexities. And I feel like, you know, there needs to be this kind of large global handshake between kind of the IT community, if you will, and the geo community. Um, because we just, we interject so much complexity and difficulty into their world that they're not accustomed to. And it's not that we don't have a ton to learn. I feel like in the world of AI, we've learned a ton, uh, but I think we have a lot to give back. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, th yeah, thanks for the comments, uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i a relatively new joiner to the world of uh, Geo, but have a, a long background in the world of AI. And yeah, I would say, I, I agree with those comments, you know, that there's a lot that we have to, to learn from, from each other. I mean, I think there's a lot that we can take from the conversations around AI ethics in general that are, can, can drive the, the way that we operate, particularly within, uh, within businesses. But there is something, there's a special kind of complexity to, to geospatial problems. And yeah, that, that, that's something that we, um, we don't want to all be learning individually. So there's, there's a, it's, it, and it, it's, it's, it's balancing off that, that massive opportunity to make better products for, for hundreds of millions of people across the, across the world, but without uh, running into all of those roadblocks individually. So it's, um, it's, it's great to be part of this larger conversation. I mean, real quick on biggest challenge, greatest opportunity. Yeah, so uh, one just one comment on what, what Chris mentioned. Um, at, we at the at Anno actually have the luxury that our chief AI officer is also a geospatial gal. So she's got a geospatial background and worked at the NGA for a really long time. Her name is Ashley Antonidis. Um, so we have that really special sauce that I think Chris just mentioned, where we have the AI expertise uh, with her PhD from Stanford but also 12 to 15 years as a geospatial analyst that was on the floor working on, you know, petting uh, FMV video um, to, to kind of bring all the magic together. Uh, biggest challenge and opportunity. What we're working on at Anno right now uh, in partnership with actually UTSA, which I'm approaching, I am San Antonio based. So uh, UTSA is, is my alma mater currently for my PhD program. Um, is to approach their data science community and see if there's a way we can start combing through some of these open source data sets that are now basically benchmarks. They're basically the gold standard uh, for a lot of AI activity and a lot of model development and see if there's a way that we can start geo encoding all of those data sets, right? So making sure that all of those data sets have the proper metadata associated with them that actually geolocate them to a specific area in the world so that we can accommodate that as almost a third dimension. Uh, in reality, it's probably like the 20th dimension, uh, but, a, but an additional dimension into how we train our models and how what data points we take into consideration when we do train them. Uh, so I see a lot of challenge, but I also see a lot of opportunity. And I also see a ton of work for a lot of data science undergrads who are interested in going through <laughs> thousands and thousands of images uh, and geo encoding them. Um, but hopefully we're, we're hoping to make it a little bit more fun than that. But um, yeah, that's that's all I've got to, to add to the conversation. Yeah. Great okay. points, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Um, hey, listen, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So not everybody has to answer any question. And here's a tough one, I think. Are we real? This is from, um, oh, geez, did it just just went off my screen? I can't believe it. Um, it was to the extent, are, are, are we really sure that people uh, are, um, that are interested in kind of protecting um, uh, personal privacy? Uh, is anybody, all of, I can't believe it. it, it I, I think I might've just answered that one. Was that the one about oh. in, un, uh, that I said that nobody wants to be intentionally biased and somebody disagreed? Um, why am I not seeing it? Yeah. If you look at the, the answered section of the questions and answered. Uh, okay. Maybe that's it. Sorry, you guys. I'm, uh, I apologize for screwing that up. Um, no, but I, I think you're, I mean, it, look, it is attention, right? It's, um, 
you have companies, governments that are trying to roll out capability, right? It's a capability that customers say they want, you know, it's some enhancement to their lives and there's a trade right now. Um, and, you know, how much of your uh, personal location data do you have to expose in order to get that functionality? How much of your, you know, nightly movements, how much of your consumption patterns uh, do you have to disclose in order to get that functionality? And I think that's central to what we're all grappling with, right? Uh, we, when somebody says, hey, would you like this new capability, capability that makes your life better? we all kind of stop and pause and start listening. Um, and it's rare that it comes with, you know, like when you see those pharmaceutical uh, commercials, like, would you like to, this to solve your cancer? And you're like, yes. And you go, okay, well, it might lead to, you know, a thousand bad things written in small fonts at the bottom. Um, but, you know, we haven't figured out how to do that well inside IT and, and geo in general. Thanks, Chris. Um, Caroline, it looks like you're typing an answer, but I think it's an important question for everybody to hear. How can the knowledge of local stakeholders be elevated kind of to the same level um, as insights gathered by the holy grail of data? Yeah, I, I was saying that um, we need to develop mechanisms that also improve the way that we can actually listen to the information of local stakeholders and, and use it as well. So for example, some of the, the projects that I mentioned, um, one of them, the Digital Works for Resilience, was also looking at how we can take information from uh, local stakeholders and actually use it in, in the validation of models as well. And like one interesting situation uh, as an example is that um, some uh, stakeholders were trying to identify bus stops and certain services in an informal area. And then people were taking pictures of areas that they said, okay, this is a bus stop. But then when it was being checked by somebody from a completely different country in context, they said, okay, it's not a bus stop because I don't see a sign. How is this a bus stop? But it's just because in that area, um, what was a bus stop or not had a very informal, you know, just very informal. So of course you didn't have a sign because none, none of the bus stops have a sign. So in, that also shows really the, the importance of integrating this information. And also that, um, um, that we need to develop mechanisms that we can also um, bring this information back and forth in a different way. That as we are developing AI models or global models from our offices as a developer, we need to also get better mechanisms in place to share and get validation from local stakeholders. Thanks. You guys, we're running close on time, but um, Chris, you're getting some credit for localization, new word of the day, so good for that. Um, Stephen, I saw you nodding when Caroline was talking. Anything you wanna um, add to that last comment on local? kind of versus yeah community. i mean it really like resonates I mean, individual versus community you know yeah i mean at tom tom we, we've we spend a lot of our time making maps um and notice there's there's a big difference between making maps depending on which part of the world you're in um and it yeah the really that um that it really triggered me that idea i mean we, we put a lot of effort into uh, automating the process of perhaps detecting detecting signs you know, we, we have a uh, mobile mapping uh, vehicles that are driving around um, to, to map out a road network. And we look, we spend a lot of effort on mapping signs and it really, really um, made me laugh. Uh, yeah, that there are many parts of the world where, where the signage is, is not, like our, our cultural expectations, particularly from my perspective in the, in the Netherlands, in Western Europe, everything's signed. But we, um, we should be really, um, become more and more aware that that's not the case. Uh, throughout the world, and that's a that's a challenge for for auto automation in general. Good. Um, Chris, real quickly, you've got a question about. Could you just real quickly expand on number nine of the charter, where de anonymization is achievable through cross referencing multiple data sources? Well, I mean, I think that's just something we've all anybody who's been grappling with this over the past twenty years, right? We we all started with uh, things like telemetry data, uh, where you know people would say, "Well, you know, I've I've taken their cell phone number off of this and their name off of this and all identifiable account information off of it. Therefore, it's anonymous." Um, and you go, "Well, okay, but I have uh, the most unique thing any individual has isn't their fingerprint." It isn't their like retina scan, it's their space time travel pattern. And, you know, when I can pull out of that haystack a, a particular 
route, you know, over over time um, that, you know, addresses, you know, my individual, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, place of employment and where I live and where I pick up my kids and where, you know, I'm having an affair with somebody who's not my wife, not me, but like somebody else, right? The, these become the most intimate kind of details of your life, um, where even though the name and the, the phone number and all the identifiable information is taken off of it, you can really easily reverse engineer again, you know, like, where are all of us, uh, the vast majority of the time around midnight to 5am? We're at our house. All of that data is public record data. Um, you know, so it, it's actually quite easy to de-anonymize anything. Um, when you de when you anonymize and aggregate, right, that's, that's better. And there's statistical methods to allow for aggregation that I know the U S census deals with. And I'm, I'm quite sure Tom, Tom is very facile with, um, and those are all things that we seek. And those are best practices. We hope everybody um, uh, takes advantage of, but yet if they don't, you know, the notion that like, oh, you know, th this was all done anonymous, I'm quite sure uh, you realize that uh, there's, there's spillage, there's leakage of information about the most intimate parts of your life that you may just not be thinking of when you take advantage of that app or that piece of technology. Yeah, Thanks. if I could just uh, add on that, Chris, yeah. I mean, the, the process of anonymization is is a lot more sophisticated than just taking away the name Chris Tucker and saying, okay, oh, we don't know who this guy is anymore, you know, and, and that's something we put a lot of attention on internally at Tom Tom. Like we don't, um, we don't be having persistent tracking IDs uh, of any kind. Um, and what you also see is that um, uh, around that, the, the, the security is so closely related to privacy. So like the way that we store the data you know, we, we, that becomes so important as part of that privacy uh, component. You, you don't, obviously you, you want to make sure that that data is not accessible from the outside world. And if in the rare scenario that that did happen, that there's absolutely no way of figuring out this is where, where, where Chris Tucker is, is, is sleeping at night. You know, that's, that, that's not the, the conversation we want to be having. Which is fantastic, and I can show you ten data sets that aren't at TomTom, Tom where it's actually much easier to do it, right? So it's a struggle because I think there are some companies that are aware of these issues and committed to resolving them. There's other companies that are aware of the issues and maybe not so committed. Then there's a bunch of organizations that just aren't aware of the issues and aware of the complexities, and they haven't built into their core engineering and operation ways to deal with it in a, in a useful and sophisticated way. So I really appreciate Stephen just gave you a little masterclass there, right, on a company that's concerned about it, that, that puts things in place at like the most core level to their enterprise. Yeah, very nice. Um, I mean, if you're still there, I just want to give you an opportunity to maybe weigh in on this last issue. And if you're not, that's okay too. I do see um, uh, just some comments in the chat about kind of more case studies where it was absolutely essential uh, that we uh, kind of put these uh, mechanisms in place. And, um, and so I do appreciate the case studies that were presented here. But I mean, anything else kind of last word uh, on behalf of the whole panel? Because I do know we're going to move into a networking session where people could ask you individual questions, okay? And we'll try to do that in the next three or four minutes. But Amina. Yeah, so I, I definitely hear, um, I think it was Steven's point on anonymization, right? It's not, it's not that simple. Uh, and in the patent that we filed and the patent work that we're doing right now, we're very quickly realizing, for example, on a license plate issue where it's considered license plates are considered PII and also have a geo element attached to them because each state has a different license plate look or feel. Uh, or internationally, you might have within the EU, different license plates coming from different countries. Um, the data, the, uh, the way data is handled from the moment it's collected, all the way into how the data is rendered to the customer in a product can all be handled in an ethical way. Um, but the way to do this is so much, it, it's still so in its infancy. Right. So in, in one of the questions that I had answered uh, previously that I think is relevant to this conversation, 
I like to take Andrew Ng's approach, the data centric approach, right? Of thinking of data as being the central point of velocity for any AI system, as opposed to the actual AI code itself or the ML engineering work that you could do, but working with the data as kind of the core central point to how well your system works. And um, I, I think that that those conversations around how to ethically handle data and how to anonymize data or maybe reduce features and data that are not needed for model development even prior to the data science team hitting that data set and, and actually making models off of it. That is something that we're experimenting with at Anno AI just because we think it's best practice that if we don't need PII for whatever uh, machine learning model goal that we have set with the customer, then we should minimize or anonymize it and work with the other features that we need within the data set in order to accomplish the task. Now, I don't feel like the industry is at the point yet where enough people have done this to see how adversely um, this might affect AI systems if you were to dumb down or obfuscate specific features uh, in your data sets, because there are problems that are, that are kind of hidden there too, as well that I'll acknowledge. Um, but yeah, definitely hear you, Stephen. Uh, and Chris on the anonymization kind of points that you made. Uh, we're struggling with them in real time uh, at our company at Anno and, and at the Data Ethics Consortium as well. Great. Caroline, any last word from you? No, I just said it's also really nice to, to see that there are people from so many different uh, positions actually working on the team. You know, we have industry, academia, and everybody working together. And I think that's really important moving forward to actually finding the solution. So I think that is something that's really promising. Yeah. That, you know, honestly, that's a great note to end on. Uh, we talk a lot about hyper partnering and just bringing people together. And it was really rewarding for me personally to hear each of you talk about this topic. I learned a lot. Um, let's again thank ITU for hosting this. Um, thank everybody in the audience. Uh, and again, ITU will host uh, will a real short uh, um, networking session. Uh, so we'll get off this platform, log back in on the neural network. And if you guys could stay around for another 15 minutes just to answer questions uh, from people uh, in the audience to you specifically, that would be most appreciated. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, you did just a great job. <laughs> thank you, Barb. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah. Nice meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.